Hello and welcome to this World Nuclear Association interview. This is a series of interviews that are looking at the topics that will be discussed at the World Nuclear Association Strategic E-Forum 2020, a series of panel discussions that will be held on the 9th, 10th and 11th of September. To find out more about that event and how to register for free, please go to www.worldnuclearforum.com. But today, I'd like to welcome Patrick Fragman, President and Chief Executive Officer of Westinghouse Electric Company. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning, Jonathan. Thanks for inviting me. Today, governments are facing some serious challenges, most immediately from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the health impacts they are looking at how to regenerate their economies and build new jobs. But at the same time, they still have the long-term challenge of transitioning to a clean energy system. So given these things that governments are facing, why is it that they should look to nuclear energy? Right now, as you know, electricity is, is becoming the, the fuel of choice. And in particular, electricity is pushing back a lot on, on coal. So it's a great opportunity for nuclear energy to show its benefits. Obviously, first, the economic benefits. As you know, the installed fleet of, of nuclear plants in many countries is among the lowest cost of electricity, more or less at par with large hydro. But also, the environmental benefits. Uh, it's obviously a, a clean power that can, that can work hand in hand with renewables in a clean energy system. It's very dispatchable. So the combination in particular with intermittent renewables is a great combination. You mentioned also the jobs. Definitely, uh, referring, for instance, to a joint study performed by the IEA and, and, and OECD, uh, nuclear energy can provide a, a certain amount of jobs which are remarkable. It's about 200,000 job years for 1,000 megawatts electrical units. And, and there is more. I mean, if you think about the future of the energy systems, having a hydrogen-based energy system, for instance, nuclear power can be an enabler of that, but also applications in very hot or very cold countries. These cell applications, which are very electricity intensive, could very well be combined with nuclear power. Or on the contrary, combined heat and power generation is a great application in colder climates. So there are many, many ways uh, to look at all the benefits uh, that nuclear power can bring. And, and, and I'm not even stopping there. We could have medical applications. I mean, you know, you know the, the extent of it. So very widespread type of benefits. So if nuclear offers all these benefits, it's very much going to be an energy for the future. But how will it need to evolve to be part of that future energy system? I think it needs to evolve by uh, having to work more, and not only internally on making sure that we are all aligned, but obviously also working on stakeholder management. Uh, we need to convince the general public. Uh, we need to convince policymakers, decision makers, that in fact all those benefits are objective, are fact-based, and put do, try to put more of those facts on the table. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by how much the gas industry has managed to position itself as a, as a clean fuel when you think that basically for each kilowatt of gas burnt, you basically generate half of the emissions that, that coal would, would also generate. So at the end of the day, it is half as dirty as, as coal but they managed to position themselves as a clean fuel in, in, and positioning themselves also in combination to renewables. I think we should take this as a lesson and try to do more about advocacy and stakeholder management. So if nuclear power is a real clean energy system, how is Westinghouse going to meet the demand that countries have around the world for carbon-free energy? I mean, Westinghouse has two feet. Uh, we have a a foot on the uh, supporting and increasing the performance of the installed fleet, the operating fleet. And we have another foot on, on the new build. And on the new build, we have a fairly large portfolio coming from micro reactors to with, with the Evinci to, to large reactors with AP1000, uh, where we have already four units operating in China and soon we'll have two more on the US grid. Um, so we believe we have a portfolio of technologies that can really help the customers uh, and at the end of the day, the societies to reach all the benefits that we're, that we're discussing. First, have a safe, environmentally friendly type of source. 
The second one is economic and, and, and well-performing, and, and that's working on the availability of the fleet and making sure that we work on, on increasing the performance, doing upgrades and, and upgrades. The third piece is obviously everything related to the integration of renewable into those new energy systems, which are, for instance, going to see a growing share of renewables. Load following is a good example of things that normally should allow nuclear plants to be much more friendly to those new energy systems. So we are working in all of those directions with the mindset of bringing value to our customers and at the end to many other stakeholders. You've made the case that nuclear energy should have an important role, uh, but what is needed to ensure that investments are made in nuclear technology? So th the first one is that we need to keep in mind is it's not only a cost topic, it's also an, a risk topic. And, and the uncertainty around the nuclear projects uh, is, is probably also something that deters quite a few investors. So we need to work on both accounts. I mean, we have a certain number of levers which are well known to work on the cost, working on the supply chain, working on simpler, simple designs are definitely levers of choice. To work on the cost and on the risks, we need to have in mind that the cost of the plants is largely driven by the construction time and by the construction, uh, by the construction effort. So everything which can effectively streamline the construction time is go for the overall cost and risk. And we're, that's why we're working a lot, for instance, on modular design. The AP1000 is, uh, is a design which, in addition to its passive safety features, is, is very modular and compact. The footprint is about a third of all the equivalent reactors of Generation 3, and even smaller than many SMRs that you find on the market. The other piece of the, of the cost is coming, obviously, about the, the financing piece. And, and you know that, uh, that financing is, uh, is an area which counts a lot given the duration of those projects. So obviously, we are working, uh, we are very glad to see the evolutions in the international financing and on the US side, uh, the, uh, the US DFC in combination with the Exim Bank, the new financing which is being made available to nuclear projects is a great movement in the, in the right direction. There are also other things which are linked to standardization, having a fleet approach. Uh, we have now four units of AP1000 operating in China, and when we, when we started to work on this program, they, those units have a very similar configuration. As early as the third unit, we could see already a substantial double-digit reduction in the overall cost of the plant. So having a fleet approach, having a kind of harmonization of the requirements is something that we should do more with customers, with regulators, and that can definitely help to drive the cost. And last but not least, there is also an element that we as industry leaders have under our wings and our responsibility is the expertise. And that's something that also is, a, is probably a lesson from, from past issues is we have to make sure we avoid loss of expertise in the future. That's why as Westinghouse, we continue to invest in talents and continue to make this nuclear industry and Westinghouse in particular an attractive place for talents today and tomorrow. You've touched there on, on one more issue I'd like to ask about, which is the, the benefits uh, that NUCA brings in terms of employment and skills uh, that you're investing in talent. When we need to generate jobs and make our energy cleaner as well, how is it you see the nuclear energy's contribution on, on these areas? Obviously, it's, uh, it's about training and making sure that we continue to, uh, to, have, to attract uh, young people to go into, into that industry, which has, which has a definitive future for, for many. And uh, we have a certain number of programs in, in many countries, especially where we operate, where we have large facilities, both in the US, but also in Europe. We have, for instance, a program in place in Sweden in partnership with customers and other industrial partners, not very far from our fuel facility station next to Stockholm. We have a program in the UK. We have programs in the US. Uh, so all this aspect of training and, and educating, especially in technologies which are advanced technologies for many industrial sectors, can be of interest to, uh, to many, uh, many young folks. The second piece is obviously about continuously training our, our people. And that's also something which is part of our investment plans and on which we continue to make sure that, that we keep at the edge. It comes also as a requirement because new technologies are appearing, digitalization as an example, or new technologies in many areas, design and, 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 and operation and maintenance as an example as well. And, and we need to make sure our workforce keeps up. 
As we draw to a close with this interview, I'm just wondering, Patrick, is, is there a final message that you would like to convey? Um, I think what we what we can see when we have meetings with you know among among ourselves is uh, we're all convinced that uh, at the end of the day the nuclear energy has many benefits and should be should be considered way better. Uh, it's good that uh, that we we believe that internally, but we should make sure that this perception is also shared by all the other stakeholders, and that's what we have to work on: uh, making sure that we reach out to the external world, making sure that we can share the facts, and that we make sure that other uh, players also share the same view as we have, whether the academics, whether it's NGOs, whether it's governments, make sure that we reach out to decision makers and to the general public to gradually change the perception of the nuclear industry. I'm rather optimistic when I see uh, the trends which is happening in many countries on how the opinion of tilt the opinions are tilting in a more favorable way toward nuclear energy. We have to build on that momentum and we have to reach out. Patrick Fragman, thank you very much indeed for joining us. That concludes this interview. To find more interviews, please go to www.worldnuclearforum.com, where you'll also find information about our Strategic eForum 2020 event. There are details there about the panelists, as well as how to register for free so you can access those panels. But for now, thank you very much for joining us and goodbye.